Dr. Chris Brunskill is an electronics engineer specialising in small satellite systems and mission design. He obtained a Master's of Engineering degree in Electronics and Satellite Engineering from the University of Surrey and a PhD in Space Robotics from the Surrey Space Centre. He has been responsible for the development and delivery of a multitude of CubeSat missions, focused in the creation of new satellite applications that utilise state-of-the-art flight, ground and launch technologies for demonstration of new mission concepts. He is now responsible for creating missions that enable new capabilities for space logistics and services at D-Orbit UK. Chris is passionate about open, innovative technology development in the space sector. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for uh, coming to this presentation today. My name is Chris Brunskill and I work for a company called Deorbit. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today, today about how we provide logistics solutions in space. Uh, Deorbit is a, an interesting company that's been around for, for quite a few years. Um, in fact, next year will be our 10th anniversary, but we're still quite small. And uh, it's, it's in the last few years that um, we've seen this huge growth in the new space industry. And that's put us in a really strong position to provide these commercial transportation solutions and services into the new space industry. This is quite a sort of new and an interesting approach to, um, to launch services. Uh, and indeed, it allows us to explore some interesting um, engineering solutions as well. Um, and this is all part of a, of a longer term vision that we have to provide uh, comprehensive on orbit logistics solutions. So while a lot of the work we do today focuses on the terrestrial elements, the uh, ambition is to extend those out into space as well. So I'm going to talk to you today, today a little bit about the orbit and, and who we are and, uh, and, and some of our background. Um, I'm then going to talk about the, uh, the, the future of in-orbit uh, manufacturing and, and services. Um, and then I'll look at what the orbit is currently doing to, to address those needs. And, uh, and then I'll finally uh, uh, finish up um, looking at, uh, at the future and some of the next steps as we, we move on beyond what we're currently doing. So let's start off with a bit, bit of background on who Deorbit are and, and what we do. Um, so the, the bottom line is we provide end-to-end -end mission services. This starts from uh, satellite manufacturing, which is in a fairly traditional way. Um, we also provide launch and deployment services. Um, but then we continue that uh, beyond um, deployment onto orbit to provide these on-orbit logistics and transportation services as well. Um, this allows us to provide precision uh, orbital deployment of our customer payloads from, uh, from the spacecraft that we build. And these spacecraft are uh, essentially space tugs or space taxis. Uh, I'm going to talk about them in, in quite some more depth uh, later on in this presentation. But this allows us to uh, solve the, the last mile problem, particularly for manufacturers and owner operators of uh, smaller uh, satellite manufacturers, uh, CubeSats being the obvious one, but also uh, small sats in, in general. Um, so it's about taking them from the deployment of, of a uh, launch vehicle at a stage and manoeuvring to a position where they're in a much more prefer preferential position for their uh, commercial or, or scientific uh, mission objectives. Um, and the service we provide to, to, to enable that allows that uh, mission activity for our customers to happen much more quickly than they would have otherwise have done uh, with, a, with a traditional launch service. Um, uh, or alternatively, it allows you to uh, mitigate the need for, for on-board propulsion on, on what is already a, a small satellite. Um, and then the, uh, the, the sort of the wrapping up of that is we also provide end-of-life disposal solutions as well. So Dealbit's uh, a relatively small business, but we are multinational. Um, so I'm based in the UK uh, and uh, we have a small office here of, of engineers. Um, started up last year, uh, but we're growing quite quickly, uh, despite the challenges that, that this year has thrown up. Um, what we've seen is um, that there's plenty of activity in the, uh, the, the new space and um, small satellite sectors, and, and particularly in the UK, um, that, that provides us with plenty of opportunity to, uh, continue, to continue working uh, and providing the, the services and products that we, that we do. 
this also aligns quite neatly with the UK strategy, investing in small businesses in the space sector uh, and also in uh, small launch solutions. And, and really, we fit quite neatly in, in between the two of those uh, uh, activities uh, and help bridge them. Uh, we also have a uh, Portuguese uh, team uh, based in Lisbon. Um, these uh, are software developers and provide um, principally the uh, uh, flight software, mission control software that we use internally to, to fly our own spacecraft, but also offer as a, a cloud-based solution for our customers as well. Uh, and we've also recently opened a, a subsidiary in, in the US uh, that's just starting to, to sort of build up some traction uh, as we speak. Um, but the, the company originally was founded in, in Italy, and it is very much an Italian company in that respect, uh, based in the, the north of Italy near Lake Como, um, where our main manufacturing uh, and operations uh, facilities are, are currently located. So we have uh, a, a long and specific history of, of flight activities. Um, as I say, the company itself has been around for nearly 10 years. Um, and, and for the large proportion of that early stage, it was really about understanding the market. Um, and, and back in 2010, 2011, the, the idea of space debris being a problem that, that not only would be widespread in its effect, but also is something that would need solving, was just starting to become an idea that, uh, that was getting some, some traction in uh, the, the various institutional and governmental and, um, and industry uh, communities. But there wasn't a huge amount of appetite to, uh, to take advantage of that at that, that early stage. So in, in the early days of, of deorbit, we, we spent a lot of time understanding how we could build solutions that might solve those problems. Um, and, and that was based around the idea of providing a new space approach, so a very agile and, and lower cost approach to high reliable, reliability systems. Um, so our first mission there in 2013 uh, was a, uh, an, an arming and triggering device for um, deorbiting motors. Um, and the approach here again was to provide a solution that was extremely high reliability um, and uh, a modular system that could be added to any given uh, mission. Um, this therefore gives you the uh, confidence that you'll be able to dispose of your, your spacecraft um, at the end of its life in a, in a safe and managed way. So even in principle, if the spacecraft itself, the primary bus, were to fail, we'd still be able to command this to, uh, to deorbit. Um, again, though, this, this perhaps is a little bit early for the market um, back in, in 2013. Um, to continue the development and extension of the, these um, skills, though, we uh, then built our, our own satellite to, to demonstrate the technology further. Um, and this was uh, DSAT. It's a 3U three, three CubeSat you can see there in 2017. Um, and that extended our um, high reliable, reliability avionics systems to, uh, to include a uh, thruster itself. So we've built a uh, uh, solid propulsion motor. Uh, you can just see the nozzle at the, uh, the far right there poking out. Uh, and the principle of this mission was to, um, to validate further the technology on orbit. So we were able to, uh, to, to fly that successfully. Um, and to, uh, to trigger the motor to reduce the uh, mission lifetime of that, of that CubeSat. Um, so, so again, that was a really interesting proof of concept. And again, perhaps even in 2017, a little bit early for the, for the industry, um, the, the, there's a long discussion around the uh, utility of, of CubeSats and, and where the sort of optimum size lies. But fundamentally, the, uh, the, the volume needed for a propulsion system for a CubeSat is still a significant uh, amount of what is already a, a constrained volume. So uh, what we found then is um, is actually the, the real interest and the real demand was uh, for placement on orbit in the first place. Um, and, and actually this was a really interesting opportunity for us because it allowed us to build a very strong commercial offering in, um, in uh, orbit transportation services, but continue to develop the uh, technologies we would need for the end of life services as well. So what came from that was uh, the, uh, the concept of ION. So this is our flagship uh, spacecraft. Um, it was launched in 2020 after uh, a few delays that were completely outside of our control um, with the launch vehicle. Um, however, we finally managed to, uh, to make it onto orbit. Uh, and um, over the last couple of months, we've been uh, successfully 
uh, deploying our customers' spacecraft onto uh, precision orbits. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that and, and what that allows uh, in, in more depth later on as well. Um, but uh, needless to say, that's, um, that's gained a significant amount of traction. It's allowed us to, uh, to build uh, and apply a huge amount of our expertise and experience in, in high reliability uh, space um, systems, but also de delivered in a, uh, a new space way, um, and, uh, and also build a uh, sustainable commercial model around that at the same time. So as I say, the, uh, the, the commercial aspect is, is key and core to our business model. Um, we, uh, if I start from the bottom, we do do an awful lot of institutional work, of course, um, with the various uh, space agencies, um, the EC and, and others as well. Um, and this allows us to, um, to focus uh, a large amount of our time on the, uh, the R&D activities that, that, again, are core to keeping our, um, our business competitive in, in what is a very fast-moving space. Um, uh, but we also are able to fly, uh, fly missions and, and provide data services um, as a result of, uh, of these institutional contracts. So again, it's about finding how we can apply our existing technologies and expertise in particular um, to, uh, to provide new commercial offerings onto the market. Uh, we're also um, actively working with the traditional space sector, so some of the, uh, the larger primes, we recognize the, the logos and names, in that middle 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 layer there, um, and again we, we provide a, you know an, an agile and an alternative approach to, to solving problems that can be very complementary to, to some of the traditional space um, uh, methodologies for, uh, for for project management and program management of, of space systems. Um, and then at the top layer we have this really interesting um, and, and now emerged formerly emergent uh, new space sector. Um, it, it, over the last five years or so, as I mentioned earlier, this, this has really gained some traction from being something that was perhaps a, a bit more obscure to being um, an extremely well-established and, and viable and proven approach to um, providing capability from space. Uh, so we have uh, a number of uh, businesses that we're working with, from the, the owner-operators like Planet through to the platform manufacturers like Clyde um, and collaborative projects with, uh, with people like OneWeb. So as I say, we, we do manufacture spacecraft. Um, we're completely vertically integrated, or, or to, the, to the large extent, uh, vertically integrated. So what you can see here are our, our clean room facilities in um, our, our main ma manufacturing facility in, in Fino Manasco. Um, this is where we perform all of our AITV uh, activities. Uh, it's also where we receive our customer uh, payloads, so the CubeSats that we integrate into our ION platform. Um, are typically delivered to, uh, to Fino, um, where they are integrated into the uh, uh, deployers that are part of the, the ION platform. As I say, we, we're, we're typically quite vertically integrated. We do a lot of the uh, baseline manufacturing and assembly, uh, and also the, the, the system by system uh, test and validation in-house as well. Uh, we've developed a, a number of, uh, of our own systems and indeed integrate those uh, into the, uh, the final systems uh, in-house as well. And also, as, a, as I've previously mentioned, we have our own mission control centre. Um, this is interesting in, um, in two respects, in that we, uh, we, we both operate our spacecraft ourselves uh, from uh, from Fino, uh, using ground station networks to allow us to extend the uh, the, the scope of, of where we are able to, to make contact with our platforms. Um, but equally, the, uh, the the software we use um, is uh, an in-house development that we call Aurora, uh, and that's a, a cloud-based uh, mission control solution um, that provides us with a huge amount of flexibility, both in where we can deploy and, and establish uh, the, the functionality of a mission control center, uh, but also in terms of how we customize and, and develop that for our, uh, our various missions. Uh, and we have a, a, a very accessible uh, customization suite uh, based on uh, Python uh, scripting that allow us to quickly and, and effectively reconfigure Aurora for, uh, for each mission. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, what we found is that, uh, as is often the case, where we've spent time developing a solution that, that solves a problem that, that we were having, 
um, in that there were no uh, off-the-shelf and affordable uh, mission operations solutions available when we when we were looking for one. What we're finding is that this is also uh, something our customers are uh, struggling with as well in, in some cases. So uh, this is uh, now being developed as a, um, a commercial offering as well. So all of this comes together into the, um, the services that we provide. And really, this is where the, the, the strong theme of, uh, of commercial activities and the commercial focus of our business comes in. Uh, so f fundamentally, we're a, a, an engineering um, organization, but the way we sustain that is through these commercial services that we provide to the wider industry. So Innovit Now is the, the name we provide to or, or use for uh, the provision of, uh, of launch services. Um, it's, uh, it's an end-to-end -end solution that uh, manages all of the terrestrial uh, and on-orbit logistics for getting your spacecraft from its, uh, its manufacturing uh, place of origin uh, through to the precision um, location that's needed on orbit. Uh, and we can do that in, in a variety of ways using the onboard propulsion system and, and other orbital maneuvering uh, techniques uh, that, that ION can take advantage of. Um, so uh, the ION uh, satellite carrier vessel uh, is, um, uh, in its first iteration, you can see that uh, on the left there, ION Mark 1, uh, capable of carrying 48 uh, units of, of CubeSats. Um, but the evolved version, the, the uh, image on the right at the bottom of the slide there uh, is now uh, uprated to 64 U uh, of CubeSats, uh, but also in a very flexible configuration. So that's an indication of, of total volume, but not necessarily the specific size uh, or shape that the uh, payload needs to arrive in. So, so indeed, we can quickly and easily reconfigure that for, uh, for example, microsatellites that perhaps aren't built to the CubeSat st standard. Uh, and, um, and as part of the, the overall service offering, then we are able to use our uh, expertise in-house to provide the complete end-to-end -end mission solution, so uh, analytical mission analysis. Uh, we can do platform engineering services. We uh, develop uh, our own software, as, as I've mentioned uh, in the previous slides, um, and uh, uh, functional checkout and testing as well, uh, and indeed transportation and all of the insurance and logistics around that. So this is a comprehensive uh, solution that allows us to uh, provide this last mile transportation that really isn't available anywhere else at the moment to um, uh, uh, manufacturers of, of small satellites uh, where, where procuring an entire launch vehicle is, is not an option to them. So this service uh, works quite simply from, from a practicalities perspective for us. Um, it's uh, in, in that first stage we, we aggregate those those payloads um, and the, the image there indicates through the different colors that uh, we, we typically receive those from uh, a variety of different customers um, not necessarily always but uh, with the, the scope of what we can carry then that, that's often the case um, and we uh, consolidate those into a, a single uh, mission um, flown on ION so that leads us to stage two where we integrate those payloads into the ION bus uh, that's then transported to uh, the launch site where we manage all of the integration and final checkout validation and preparation for launch. So, for example, if, that, if your payload requires any final um, uh, activities before launch, so things like battery charging is, is, a, is a common one, then, then that's part of the service that we can offer at the uh, launch integration site. Uh, Post-launch, then, uh, of course, we are then... Uh, wholly capable of uh, deploying those payloads onto the um, uh, required orbits. Uh, and for example, um, one of those uh, solutions might be a fast dispersion uh, solution. And there's a number that I'll talk about in more depth later on. But that's an example of how instead of waiting for, for natural drag to space out a, uh, a constellation, we can um, uh, deploy those uh, spacecraft into uh, a much more effective configuration um, than, than would otherwise have been possible. So that that sort of sort of explains where we've come from and, and how we've ended up at what we currently provide. But really, this is just the first step of, of the longer term vision of deorbit, um, and that's to provide uh, on orbit servicing and manufacturing and then the logistics services required to achieve those um, uh, in space. 
and and there is an emergent market of, of purely or of transactional activities purely occurring uh, on orbit that, that will define the future of the in-space economy. And, and while that might sound a bit fantastical, um, this is this is the way that uh, we're we're seeing the, um, the 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 market and the communities evolve as it currently stands. And, and that's proven in our space transportation services. We are able to uh, to create commercial value in the the last mile transportation. Um, but but again, that's the first step, and and really that that leads into this this future vision of um, creating the uh, the logistics solutions for uh, for assembly and manufacture, um, and uh, and the next the next step will be uh, removal and and um, addressing the uh, the space debris issue. I'm going to talk about that in a bit more depth uh, shortly, um, but but it, but but clearly the the technologies that we are developing for deployment on orbit can be used for for removal uh, of uh, of debris from orbit at its end of life. Uh, or, or that's uh, currently located on orbit from, from existent missions. Um, and then there's a natural continuation of steps. So relocation would be to, uh, to rendezvous with a, uh, with, a, with a payload to mechanically uh, um, dock with that. Uh, and uh, instead of moving it to a, uh, a lower orbit or to, to deorbit it completely, um, moving it to a more uh, preferential orbit based on what the customer needs. Um, the extension of that then is is indeed life extension. So that's not not just orbital reconfiguration, but also uh, more uh, low level integration after docking for things like um, uh, replacement of, of faulty parts or um, uh, refueling activities. This then again by na nature extends to assembly, where kits of parts could effectively be launched uh, on on orbit uh, or to orbit. Um, using uh, traditional launch vehicles, but perhaps in a more uh, efficient packing configuration in, in the upper stage. Uh, and then uh, the, the final assembly is done on orbit. Um, and, and large reflector arrays and mirrors are, are classic examples of, of the sort of activities that that might, might entail. And then finally, we go to the, the, the manufacture stage, which is the, the, the fundamental um, uh, creation of uh, components and, and uh, component parts of uh, a future on orbit infrastructure. So being able to uh, to provide the capability to do that using more uh, raw materials or, or again sort of more fundamental materials um, is uh, is going to be required in order to uh, to achieve that. So so we see ourselves at the early stages of of the path towards providing the, the capabilities and the infrastructure and the, the, the solutions uh, needed to, to meet that, that sort of future uh, in-space environment and, and everything that comes with that economically, technologically and, and societally. So that's a, a bit of the background on deorbit and, and how we've come to where we are today and, and what it is that we provide in terms of products and services into the into the uh, the, the industry um, but but so what you know why, why have we made the choice that we we have to, to focus on this area and you know, how does this uh, become a sustainable opportunity uh, as we uh, as we continue to develop our um, offerings as a, as a business um, so what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about uh, in orbit servicing and manufacturing in more depth and and again, sort of some of the uh, reasons why uh, the requirement for logistic services on orbit uh, are, uh, are an increasing area of, uh, of interest for the industry. So I'm going to start with a brief history of, uh, of access to space um, and, and try and highlight some of the, uh, the, the reasons why this has driven us to the point where, uh, where a company like Deorbit can, can exist. Um, and uh, for, for our audience, some of this or, or a lot of this might be uh, might be obvious or, um, or well known. But I'm trying to uh, to sort of show how the, the these sort of well known activities and well known um, uh, uh, events in the history of space um, again have driven us in this in this direction. So if we go all the way back to the early days of the space age, um, the, uh, the 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 reason why we've not been able to, um, to provide much infrastructure on, on orbit is, uh, is, has been technological constraints. Um, they've limited what we can deliver to space, uh, with, with perhaps some, some examples in, in, or some exceptions uh, in things like uh, Apollo really being proof of uh, why it's so challenging to take that approach. 
um, the you know, scaling that back down to something that's more widely available um, is, is not particularly practical. And you know, for all of the benefits, uh, it, it really highlighted those those challenges in, in the early days. So so what we found is that uh, actually in the early days of of, uh, of space launch and space launch services. Uh, small satellites were a thing then, and, and you may recognize the image of uh, Prospero there on, on the right. Um, that was only 60 or 70 kilos. Um, it also shows that small satellites have been around for ages, so in principle they're not, not necessarily uh, a new concept either. Um, but, but really it was, it was the, 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 the functionality of what we could build at the time that was holding us back uh, in, in, a, in a sustainable way. I think we then whisk forward into the 80s and, and 90s. Um, what we found was that while uh, there wasn't necessarily a commercial um, opportunity in the early stages, uh, over time that became more apparent and, um, and, and you may recognize the original, one of the early SSTL teams there with Eurosat 1. Um, and, and SSTL are really interesting because they've always been a very commercially focused company and, and driven by the commercial goals of what they offered into the industry um, over the, the last 30 or 40 years that they've been in operation. Um, so the, well, this, this allows them to use uh, small satellites to, uh, to, to, to lower the cost of access to space uh, by de developing those um, with, uh, with lower overheads, with less stringent engineering requirements. Um, and making that much more accessible as a as a solution to uh, to the wider industry, um, and uh, again an interesting sort of quirk of of, uh, of society at that time was that uh, a large amount of, of early SSL business was uh, was indeed to, to teaching other nations how to build small satellites uh, and provide that initial capability uh, for uh, for those countries on a national basis. Um, so it, it, it started to open up access to space through using uh, the, the, the commercial application of, of small satellite technology. What we then found in the early 2000s uh, was um, that uh, the, the growth in uh, investment and, and sort of, uh, achievements in, in technology uh, and largely electronics and, and ultimately consumer electronics um, further uh, reduce the cost of access to space by reducing the cost and, and of components, but also increasing their availability. Um, and from this, we saw CubeSats as, as the obvious outcome. Um, the, uh, the original intention there being uh, a way that um, university students could, uh, could get hands-on access to, um, to, to, to real engineering solutions, to, to work with them, to learn the skills and, and get the experience of, of how to build a, a functional solution. Um, but uh, and, and also with the, uh, the reduced mass, then, then suddenly there was an opportunity to, to deliver those to space as well. So CubeSats weren't just a benchtop solution. They, they actually provided, that again, a, a, not just a, a cost uh, in terms of the, the manufacturing side, but a cost in terms of the launching side uh, benefit to, um, to, to accessing space. So again, this, this sort of wasn't principally a commercial driver um, but the advances in the broader technology uh, uh, across across uh, the globe um, allowed this to become something that, uh, that, that translated quite neatly into the, uh, the space industry. Um, and then in the last 10 years or so, we've seen that taken to, um, to, to a huge extreme in the uh, commercialization of, of CubeSats and, and SmallSats, um, but particularly CubeSats. Uh, and you see there on the, the image on the right at the bottom, uh, uh, a literal stack of uh, Planet Dubs uh, ready for launch, fully integrated. Um, and again, the, the, in this instance, the commercial uh, uh, sector um, was able to take not just the design principles, but also the scalability of, um, uh, of those technologies and exploit those very, very quickly into creating uh, one of the world's most um, capable solutions within a certain set of parameters that, that had ever been seen. And, and Planet sort of took that and, and de de demonstrated its capability very, very effectively. And, and since then, we've seen other, other businesses do similar things as well. Um, so we're seeing this, not only the scaling of the size of the constellations, but also the scaling of the number of constellations. Um, and again, this is, this is purely due to the fact that this, um, this accessibility to technology is, has really 
push to push us forward in terms of what we can what we can deliver for a certain cost point and within a certain time frame um, and and it's really changed the way that we we access uh, we access space and think about space as somewhere that we can access we see this moving towards a hugely more scaled uh, application of, of small satellites and this this concept of uh, multiple mega constellations or large scale constellations is is now um, is now a reality uh, the image on the right there showing uh, the um, the stack of Starlink spacecraft on top of a Falcon 9. Uh, um, SpaceX having now launched hundreds of these uh, uh, satellites to create their, their initial deployment of their constellation. Uh, OneWeb, of course, also now uh, in the process of, uh, of launching their constellation of spacecraft, aiming for initially six or 700 uh, satellites. Um, so what we see in, in the plot at the bottom shows this quite effectively is that uh, we're now at this transition point where uh, the scaling up of, um, of, of infrastructure and, and activity on orbit is, uh, is increasing almost exponentially. And of course it will tail off, but it does show that we're in a, a, a huge growth stage of the, uh, of the market and the industry um, providing these, um, these solutions, both the satellites themselves, but also the services that, that come from them. So what does this mean if we've got uh, companies providing um, or deploying huge constellations, uh, but also a much broader uh, concept of access to space? Well, uh, clearly space debris, and, and this should come to, to no surprise, it's no surprise to, to anybody. Um, the, the traditional approach or the legacy approach to space has uh, typically not considered the uh, the, the, the de-orbiting uh, of, uh, of infrastructure at end of life. We do see um, end of life planning, uh, which is, is sort of most effectively demonstrated in geo uh, missions where uh, once the, the, the mission is, is completed, those spacecraft must uh, move themselves to a, uh, a higher graveyard orbit. Um, but uh, elsewhere, we haven't really seen quite the same uh, scrutiny. And, and again, you know, the, the the, the issue is not necessarily that we've been completely lax in our um, uh, uh, management of the, the space environment, but the fact that this has happened so quickly, really only over the last five or ten years, that we've seen this huge uh, increase in the, um, the, the uh, environment um, in space. And, and even if that wasn't the case, the fact that we are now deploying more infrastructure on orbit means that there will inherent, inherently be a greater risk to those uh, to those assets, both from other functional assets, but also from the existing um, uh, uh, objects that are resident on orbit as well. So uh, this is an emergent problem. Uh, so, so this is the problem that is starting to manifest itself uh, in a way that is much more tangible to a much wider range of, uh, of, of industry representatives. Uh, and also the, uh, the institutional and governmental uh, users of space as well. Um, and as, as such, it is now uh, an extremely relevant uh, point that we, must, uh, that we must address. So again, back to our uh, long-term view, this is the, the natural transition for, uh, for the orbit uh, from uh, the transportation services is to debris removal services as well. Uh, and again, that shows us why uh, the, the technologies that we've developed to date uh, provide that, that baseline infrastructure and capability that we can then apply to the future needs of uh, debris uh, removal and, and management. Uh, and there's a huge number of opportunities to, um, to, to, to tackle existing debris, but also to provide services to, uh, to those owners and operators uh, of new spacecraft uh, or new, new constellations where end-of-life spacecraft need to be decommissioned uh, in a safe and manageable way. So the, the, this, this sort of transition phase is happening now and, and we're focusing a, a huge amount of our time on ensuring that we have the, the capabilities in place uh, to, uh, to provide the, uh, the services on a sustainable commercial basis uh, for, uh, for debris and removal um, at the end of life as well. So that takes us on to, uh, to some of the, uh, the solutions that we've, um, we've developed at, at the orbit. 
So um, just again to recap quickly, I've, I've given you the, the top level overview of, of how we, uh, we we operate as a business and, and what we do. Um, I've gone into some of the uh, the detail of, of why we do this and how that fits into the longer term vision. Um, but what we're going to look at now is how the uh, the solutions we've developed um, have tried to tackle some of those challenges. Uh, and what you'll see is that there's no single solution at the moment. And what makes this uh, particular uh, activity at the moment really interesting is that um, we're, we're still finding our way as, as an industry as to how best to tackle these these uh, these challenges and there's lots of really good engineering ideas and solutions out there um, and the next sort of few years five or ten years maybe um, will allow us to, to really explore those um, to a much more uh, uh, detailed extent find out what works in terms of providing those uh, services and also the infrastructure that's needed on orbit to tackle this next step in, in debris removal. So just to sort of spin back to the to the history of the orbit, I, I mentioned that we developed these very high reliability um, deorbiting uh, 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 control systems um, and indeed some of the, uh, the, the thrusters that technology that was, was needed to complement those. Uh, and they actually became some of our, our earliest products uh, in, in D3, uh, the deorbit decommissioning device, uh, and D-rays. Um, and again, these are the, the productionized um, versions of those early technology demonstration uh, solutions um, and, and work in exactly the same way. They are a completely self-contained solution that can be added modularly to a customer platform um, to provide a high reliability, high confidence, end of life uh, disposal solution in the, uh, uh, the example of D3, um, but also in the context of uh, D-rays, uh, um, this can be used to, uh, to accelerate deployment on orbit uh, to the, uh, the, the operational orbit that, that a certain platform would need. Um, so, so these were targeted perhaps at, at larger spacecraft, um, and again, they, they sort of came at a time that it was still quite early in the, um, uh, the, the scaling of, of small and, and CubeSat um, solutions. Um, and again, perhaps they're a little bit ahead of their, their state, their, their time in terms of the solution they offered, but they did provide us with this opportunity to really understand how to build these high reliability solutions, to understand those markets. Uh, and then look at where there was actual genuine customer interest and consumer interest in those services. Uh, and as it turned out, it wasn't in, in single modular systems at that time. It was in uh, uh, aggregating those around the deployment of uh, uh, collections of, of small satellites. So we, we, we do have this portfolio of, of technologies, the D-Rays and D3, of course, uh, but also some examples there of some of the electronic systems. So you see the uh, uh, in, in, in the, the photographs of the electronics boards. These are the, uh, the, the the safe arming and high reliability arming and triggering systems. Uh, again, built in house at, at Deorbit. Uh, the uh, the renders of the the PCBs show some of our high capability, high reliability uh, PCB. Uh, sorry, onboard computers. Um, that, uh, that fly both on ION, but also we're, we're able to provide as, as high reliability solutions as well. Uh, and the, the image second from the right is of our self-contained uh, modular uh, ADCS solution, uh, sensor pack, um, so, uh, and sensor pack. Uh, so this is a, um, uh, a complete uh, sensor uh, solution that allows us to provide um, attitude uh, 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 knowledge, but also commanding and control as well into uh, into a platform. Uh, and again, we fly those on on our own platforms as well. Uh, so again, altogether, what we have here is a, uh, a fairly comprehensive um, package of high reliability uh, avionics solutions that can provide uh, uh, mission deployment or mission extension uh, and end of life mission services. So as I say, the, the, in, in, in effect, what this meant was that um, the, the solution was actually to bring those all together. And that's where ION came from. And, and this uh, video will give you uh, an over, overview of, of the concept. So um, I've, I've talked about it in general terms uh, throughout this, um, this presentation so far. Here what we see is um, the, the actual implementation. So it's, uh, it's a small satellite. Um, 
it's uh, it's only about uh, what's less than a meter cubed. Um, we uh, have um, uh, the lower deck of um, the uh, the main bus itself and our own avionics solution, and then we have the uh, the customer payloads uh, up to uh, six U on Ion Mark One, up to um, uh, 16 U on Ion Mark II. Uh, we integrate those into Ion. That's then integrated into the launch vehicle. And then once it's deployed on orbit, this is when Ion really comes into its own. And this is where we go from being a, a product provider to a service and solution provider. Um, so we can provide the uh, precision deployment on orbit. So um, true anomaly phasing uh, based on uh, where, where your uh, ideal situation or ideal deployment position is. Uh, fast dispersion, so um, deployment uh, around a, um, a particular orbital uh, plane uh, in a, uh, a much more um, uh, consistent and effective way. And again, this is really important because it allows our customers to make these uh, to commission their spacecraft much more quickly than, than they would have otherwise been able to do so. Uh, also, orbit raising is, is an obvious one in that we can provide the uh, the the, the, the uh, uh, Delta V to, um, to to bring the uh, the spacecraft um, to, uh, to to different uh, orbital altitudes and uh, ran shifting as well. So just to go into those uh, again in, in in summary. So this last mile transportation uh, again change of altitude is is a classic one where we can do uh, a simple home maneuver to to raise our orbit uh, and deploy our, our uh, customer payloads um, as needed. This is a really interesting one because, uh, again, a, a classic problem of being a secondary or tertiary passenger on a, a particular launch vehicle uh, means you get put where you're put and not where you need to be. Um, and uh, going that, that last few hundred kilometers uh, in altitude not only provides you with a, a longer mission lifetime than perhaps a, a, lower orbit, uh, a lower deployment orbit would do, would do so, it also provides that capability in the first place where the launch vehicle might not have been able to, uh, to provide that itself. The uh, orbit phasing and fast dispersion again is a um, is really interesting option in that it's, it's becoming much more relevant uh, as we start to see uh, an increasing number of constellation providers uh, uh, come onto the market. So people like Planet are very well established and, and there are others that are similarly well established but we're seeing this increasing growth of uh, owners and operators of uh, more moderately sized constellations. And again, what they need is, uh, is this quick deployment uh, of their capability to, to help them grow and sustain as, as business, themselves as businesses. So the fast dispersion option is really interesting because it allows us to help them provide a, uh, a complete coverage uh, orbital configuration um, by, uh, by more efficient spreading across a, a certain orbit much more effectively than they might have otherwise been able to have, have done so. Uh, and, and obviously, run changes as well are uh, something that we can provide. Uh, we actually base this initially on um, exploiting the, uh, the J2 effect uh, and, and naturally drifting uh, the, um, uh, the run time. Um, but uh, we can use a propulsive solution to that as well. Um, Clearly, in all of these solutions, there are different demands on the, the propulsion system uh, and the, the, ultimately the delta V that we can provide. Um, and, and that is, of course, a constraining resource that we have available. So a large part of the work we do behind the scenes is optimizing the, um, uh, the, the mission concept uh, to, uh, to best to provide the best capability and the best extent of services we can to, uh, to the customers that, uh, that, that we have on board. Uh, and, and obviously, from a commercial perspective, for the more demanding maneuvers, then uh, then perhaps you have to pay an additional premium. But again, that's a huge value add that perhaps wouldn't otherwise have been available to those customers. So, so we, we we constantly work on providing this this uh, uh, clear value proposition and making sure that that's tailored to what the market uh, can sustain. So. I on Mark One, our uh, first demonstration proof of concept mission uh, for, um, for for this approach to, uh, to servicing um, CubeSat owners and operators. Uh, this was named Origin for obvious reasons. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, after quite some delay due to, to, to issues with the Vega launch vehicle, uh, we were finally launched and deployed uh, in the middle of the night uh, European time. 
uh, in September 2020, uh, and this was the Vega SSMS proof of concept flight. Um, so we were launched with uh, 50 or 60 other other spacecraft um, all at the same time. Uh, I gave a preview of the image of the full stack earlier, and I'll come back to it in, in a subsequent slide. Um, but the uh, so the mission outline was was fairly um, uh, fairly simple. Uh, Vega would um, deploy Ion on orbit uh, at a certain position. Uh, and for the purposes of this mission, uh, we had commercial um, customers. So these were Planet Superdoves. Uh, we were carrying 12 of them in, in 3D configurations, of course. Um, and uh, the service we were providing was the, the fastest version. So to um, provide those uh, on a, a regularly spaced uh, true anomaly distribution around a, a single orbital plane. Um, we also did carry an onboard propulsion unit, but that was part of our uh, technology validation for the platform itself. So here is the story of, um, of the launch of, of ION and its, uh, its primary mission. Uh, you can see on the left there, ION being integrated into its uh, adapter ring. Um, the, uh, the second uh, image uh, is that full stack that I, uh, that I mentioned. So you can see the huge number of, of small satellites in various configurations. Uh, the red arrow there points to um, uh, ION uh, on board, uh, ready to be deployed after launch. Um, but interestingly, I want to draw, draw your attention also to the, uh, the blue boxes uh, directly below um, ION. And if you look closely, they're also uh, spread around the, um, the adapter there. Uh, so these are um, more typical or standard uh, CubeSat deployment um, dispensers. Uh, and they, they also, in some cases, are carrying planet doves. Uh, however, in, in the, the, this case, they will be deployed onto, onto orbit just through a, a simple ejection maneuver. Um, and, uh, and this is the traditional approach. This is where they end up, where they're put. And then in the case of planets, they have a, a fairly well-known uh, uh, differential drag maneuver uh, where they use the uh, deployed solar panels to provide a... Um, uh, a, a, a larger uh, surface area into the wind at the sort of extraneous atmosphere in, in the um, high altitude, and that allows them to uh, to, 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 to phase their orbit uh, using the, um, uh, the the change in velocity as a result. Clearly, though, that's uh, that's a one-way trip, so there's only so so far you can take that particular maneuver. Uh, also, it's uh, it's a fairly long-term maneuver as well. So bear that in mind. We'll come back to it. Um, second from the right, you can see Vega taking off, so that's uh, VV-16 um, lifting off from French Guiana, in uh, Karoo in French Guiana, uh, and um, that was uh, a successful mission, which um, perhaps is, is even more fortunate than we, we realised at the time, given, given the last, uh, last year's events and, and more recent news. Um, and then finally, and more importantly, what you can see in that fast image on the right, last image on the right, uh, is uh, a photograph captured by, in fact, one of our Desense cameras, the, the AOCS camera, um, to uh, of the uh, the SuperDove being deployed from ION. So, uh, so this is um, uh, looking uh, uh, in the direction of deployment, and um, off camera would be the dispenser of um, of ION itself. So uh, clearly, that's a beautiful image in itself, but also from a commercial perspective, it allows us to provide. Uh, a, a sort of a tangible validation of deployment to our to our customers as well. So I've been talking about this um, uh, value in, in the, the fastest version uh, and, and the effect that we can um, we can we can have uh, using the the ion approach. Uh, and this graphic really um, illustrates that quite effectively. So uh, on the right we have the fast dispersion uh, solutions. So these are the planet doves that were deployed by ION, and you can see that um, they are uh, quite evenly spaced uh, around that, that orbital plane, uh, exactly as the, the customer requested. Uh, on the left, with the, the blue uh, graphic, um, that's the, the so-called standard deployment, uh, and indeed these are the spacecraft that were deployed from those blue dispensers, uh, also on board VV-16. Um, and, uh, and again, what you can see is clearly they are uh, much more uh, clumped together, they are uh, not as effectively um, spaced out, and for a mission like planets where they need complete coverage of, of the Earth, um, this is a you know there is a diminishing return in having them stacked together so closely in, in a given uh, orbital configuration. Um, so by 
uh, providing the the InnoWit Now service to deploy those uh, more more um, efficiently, uh, those spacecraft are now able to uh, to provide a much more effective uh, revenue generating capability to Planet than their uh, than their other um, spacecraft also launched on board uh, on board Vega. Um, so you can see there quite effectively what the what value we can provide in terms of um, using a platform like Ion for this last mile dispersion or this last mile transportation uh, that, that our customers need. So that gives you a, an overview then of where we've uh, got to to date and some of the technologies that we've developed along the way um, and how they've manifested themselves into the solutions that we offer and, and, and how they add value as a, as a commercial offering to, to our customers. Um, what I'd like to do now is to, to look towards the, the future, um, both in terms of what we're, we're doing directly at, at the orbit and, and the next steps and evolution of the, uh, the technologies that we provide and the services around them, um, but also more broadly to, uh, to some of the uh, uh, drivers and, and factors in the wider industry and, and, uh, and economy that are going to uh, define where we go in the future as, as a business as well. So as I say, uh, Ion Mark II uh, is um, uh, well underway in terms of its construction. One of the um, uh, outcomes of the, the, uh, the schedule we had with the launch of, of Ion Mark I was that we were able to start working on Mark II. Even before that Mark I had been launched, we were able to take the, the, the changes in the market dynamics, but also our engineering experience, and apply that to the development of this much more uprated solution. So you can see in the, uh, the graphic there at the top right that uh, clearly the, uh, the design has evolved quite significantly. Uh, I mentioned earlier that its payload capacity not only has been increased, but also um, is much more versatile than in, in Ion Mark 1. Uh, and we have uh, a much more upgraded uh, propulsion solution as well. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the positive outcomes of, of, uh, of where we've been to, to get to this point is that um, we will be launching Iron Mark II in December, uh, and that will allow us to uh, very quickly uh, move on from the Iron Mark I uh, solution and demonstrate that we can uh, continue that, that service provision in a much more comprehensive way. And this cadence is really important because it allows us to prove to our customers and to the market that what we're doing is, uh, is keeping up with their demands. Um, so again, we were possibly slightly ahead of the market uh, with Ion Mark 1 when it was first conceived, but really the market has caught up with us and, and that's allowed us to, to really exploit that experience and expertise that we've got in a, in a very effective way. Um, so, uh, so Ion Mark 2, the mission concept, again, principally it's about last mile transportation. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, a collection of various different uh, host, uh, uh, deployed passengers. So uh, CubeSats in, in the same way that we did with Iron Mark II, uh, but we will also be carrying hosted payloads as well. So this is an enhancement to our existing service offering. Um, again, in some ways, it's selling a, a solution we developed for ourselves in terms of you know, demonstration and validation. Um, but given the, uh, the capability of the Ion uh, bus itself, um, providing the uh, capacity to integrate uh, ad hoc customer payloads um, to, uh, to validate them on orbit is, is a very compelling option. Um, and, uh, and of course, we also have that uprated propulsion system that will allow us to, uh, to demonstrate the, uh, and, and utilize uh, the, um, the wider range of, of orbital maneuvers uh, that, that, that are available to us. Um, and, uh, and even more excitingly, um, the, the, the demand that we're seeing uh, will allow us to um, start to, to increase the manufacturing rate of Ion Mark IIs. So uh, while this, this first one is going to be, uh, to be launched uh, very shortly, um, we're already uh, in the uh, position where we are planning the missions for 2021, uh, so not too far from now. Uh, we have um, a number of missions planned for, for launch uh, next year. Uh, and uh, as the market is currently showing, we uh, we intend to uh, to continue to uh, to expand that offering um, into uh, into the subsequent years as well. Now this is really interesting because what it provides us with is a very versatile portfolio of launch opportunities, and we can work much more effectively to our customers' timescales, 
space sector is is notorious for for slips and changes in schedule depending on on a variety of different factors. Uh, what we provide with with Ion and the Inorbit Now service is a much more uh, flexible solution that that allows our uh, customers to to fly when they're ready rather than when they have to. Um, so so this is enabled by this growth in demand and the the solutions that we're able to provide uh, to to meet those um, those customer needs. So this also then will demand us having a, a more comprehensive terrestrial logistics solutions. Uh, while we're clearly focused on the uh, the future of the, the on-orbit logistics requirements, we, we have to get the ground-based uh, solutions in place as well. Um, and uh, and this isn't necessarily just a deorbit thing. This is this is a trend that we're seeing now across uh, across industry um, on a, on a global scale, but but also. I'm based in the UK, so for, with a UK uh, uh, focus on this, um, we're also seeing the uh, the deployment of um, much more uh, uh, widely available, so back to the accessibility piece, um, uh, uh, facilities to allow the uh, the, the processing and, and um, transportation uh, on the ground of our payloads. So the idea of, of scalable uh, small sat manufacturing centers is something that's starting to gain traction. Uh, we uh, we have a number of initiatives in, in the UK. Uh, we're seeing uh, various uh, small satellite factories start to crop up around the world. Uh, and all of these are, are fantastically useful for a company like the Orbit because it means there's always going to be demand for our services uh, as the, uh, the the quantity of small sats are, are manufactured. Um, so. OneWeb and and, uh, and and Starlink being the the obvious sort of uh, uh, leaders in in this area perhaps don't need any of our uh, deployment services at least not at this stage um, but there is again this this highly uh, uh, accelerating market for uh, for other uh, constellation uh, uh, owners and operators uh, and that's an, as an important part of the market as, as anything else um, and uh, also the um, payload processing uh, logistics, so receiving those CubeSats and, and small satellites and hosted payloads, uh, functionally testing them, checking them out, providing any final integration either into an ION platform or, uh, or whatever other requirements they have, uh, is also an important part of that logistics solution. Uh, and again, Spaceport Cornwall is, um, is already working on uh, a payload processing facility with, uh, with the, within the scope of their partnership with Virgin Orbit. Uh, and indeed, we're also seeing other co-located processing facilities uh, starting to crop up around the UK and also more, more widely around the world. So this is the, the more broader infrastructure that's needed, again, to support the uh, and sustain the activities that we, we provide. And then on the other end of the scale, so that's sort of the, 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 the what we might, might refer to as the upstream side, so the, the, the stuff that goes onto, onto orbit. Um, the, uh, we're also seeing this evolution on the downstream side, and, and that, that goes from operations, which is sort of that transitional phase, all the way through to the data services to, to the, the end beneficiaries of, of the satellite infrastructure that we have on orbit. Um, and this is where AI uh, and machine learning, it, it's what has become as an industry standard or an industry industrialized capability is now starting or, or become much more established as a, as a capability within the um, within the space sector uh, and the opportunity now is to scale that as well and what's really interesting is for those advanced uh, data services and analytics services that are powered by AI uh, uh, concepts is that they can apply themselves across the um, uh, the whole mission so we do see that uh, obviously in uh, the ground segment, uh, tasking and optimization, particularly when you've got large cons uh, uh, constellations, is, um, is, is a, a, you know, it's an exponential problem that quickly goes beyond the reach of what uh, can be manually achieved. So uh, we see a, an obvious op opportunity to, uh, to, to, to improve uh, operations solutions in that way. Uh, and again, we have some of the technology in place already to, to support that, uh, and we're very keen to work with our customers to, 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 to further extend that, that capability. Um, looking briefly at the space segment, uh, that does also extend to uh, autonomous systems and autonomous missions. This is looking uh, again at that next step, the, the debris removal, but also onto those next um, uh, stages in the roadmap. 
uh, where we'll, we will need to have some level of autonomy to allow spacecraft to interact with one another when they're formation flying, when they're rendezvousing and when they're docking, um, that perhaps wouldn't otherwise be possible with a, with a human in the loop providing those, um, those, uh, th those commands to the spacecraft due to latency or uh, uh, ambiguities or, or information that's not available when commanding those spacecraft. Now again, we do see that already, particularly um, in space exploration systems and, and rovers, Martian ro the Martian rovers produced by NASA, again, are great examples of where this has been applied uh, already. But the opportunity now is to apply that in an, in an, indus in an industrial way uh, and also in a scalable way that, again, makes that much more accessible to the wider market. And then finally, we have the user segment. Um, and again, you know, the, the, the opportunity here in terms of the end-to-end -end service provision that, that Yorbit can provide is to put that infrastructure in place that allows the, the ultimate beneficiaries of the data, of the services, um, to use that in a much more optimal way. So how can we support our customers to provide, a, um, uh, again, the infrastructure, the data infrastructure to, uh, to receive, to process and disseminate the data that they're, they're providing to their customers um, in, a, in an effective and accessible way? So we, we see a real opportunity in, in tying that into the complete uh, mission solution. Um, and, and those technologies, as, as you can see here, uh, apply across the, the, the whole mission scope. And then finally, clearly, we have the, the orbit manufacturing uh, opportunity. Um, so the orbit logistics and debris mitigation, as it says there, these are the first commercially viable opportunities. Uh, transportation, we've proven that that's something people will pay for. Uh, debris removal, the, the, the actual value, the price that's put on that is still something that's being uh, worked out in the industry, but there's a lot of work in for coming up with the uh, engineering solutions that that will um, that will justify those uh, th those prices, um, but uh, but as I mentioned all the way back uh, in, in the earlier part of this this presentation, this is the future of the on-orbit economy, uh, and this is an emergent thing at the moment. But there will be purely transactional activities that happen on orbit where the terrestrial influence is is marginal to none, and uh, and we have to be able to work in a way that is. Um, completely independent of terrestrial intervention. So we're working on, on that opportunity. Um, the, the, these nascent markets, uh, debris, manufacturing, assembly, life extension, um, the, they're, they're all enabled by these technologies, of course, um, but that, that's, that's what needs to happen today. And that's the message here, is trying to, to show that we can come up with the solutions that will enable that we're not going to be able to jump straight in in an effective or an efficient way um, uh, at any given stage. And, and the, the work today is to understand how we can do that in an effective and, and safe uh, and efficient way uh, over the next couple of years. The space sector, certainly in the UK and, and, and to some extent perhaps in, in Europe more broadly, um, has been a really a really good example of how a commercially sustainable industry or, or ecosystem can exist and and, uh, and and this is something that really needs to, to become much more uh, uh, apparent and, and central to, to the way the space sector works um, we're starting to see that a bit more uh, more more commonly now um, but the dependency on purely governmental or purely institutional work perhaps isn't sustainable or, or it misses an opportunity that otherwise wouldn't be there. So, so looking at this from a commercial driver, from a, uh, a market-driven opportunity space, as it were, uh, is, is really important. Uh, what I've mentioned here in, in this slide also is um, there is a report on this uh, produced by the Catapult, and I would encourage you to go and uh, uh, read about that. Uh, it does mention some of the work that Diorbit's doing, but also gives a much bigger overview of, of the work that's happening in this area and how, how we're trying to drive that forwards. So thank you then for uh, your attention for this, this presentation. Um, as I say, this, this hopefully should have given you an idea of who the Orbit are and, and what we do, but also why we do it. And that, that's really, really the, the important message that I wanted to get across. Um, that the work we're doing is, is really quite interesting um, from an engineering perspective, but also from, from the fact that we're doing that in a way that, that has to be commercially sustainable. 
this provides us with huge freedom in, in the work that we do and the way that we do it um, that, that is driven by what people need and what people want um, while still allowing us to, to maintain this very visionary approach to, uh, to the, the engineering and the, the solutions that we, uh, we come up with as, as a business. Um, so uh, what I hope is that uh, in, in the future we'll be able to, to come back again and perhaps give you an update on some of our activities. Um, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for, uh, for more deep dives into any of the points that I've, uh, I've raised here and um, we can find uh, the right people from the team to, uh, to give, um, to give all, all, all the sort of oversight or in, insight into, uh, into the, the technology that we, we work with and that we have developed. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully you know, that, that won't be too far in the future before we've got much more to, to talk about and um, new things to, uh, to bring to the, to, the, to the wider audience that, uh, that has an interest in this, this activity. So thanks again for your attention and um, it's been a, been a pleasure to, uh, to talk about Deorbit today.